Hello. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Nicholas Begruen. Um, welcome. Uh, it's a sunny day in LA, so something unusual. And um, I'm grateful that you chose to be in the dark. Um, question is, will we learn something uh, this afternoon from our speakers? I hope so. I'm actually quite sure. So I want to thank Agnesia and uh, Drew and Tobias for, um, well, thinking, I mean, helping us think about a subject that I think is um, really quite important, which is, you know, who are we becoming um, as humans when we are creating sort of a new human thanks to biotechnology and thanks to AI? Uh, how are we reshaping what it means to be a human? And what is the um, limits of what it is to be a human? What is the limit of what a machine is? And are we getting more connected to what in the West we think as of the non-human? If, if you think of non-Western traditions, especially in the East, especially maybe in Japan and uh, uh, Shinto thinking, um, everything uh, is alive, um, not just humans. Everything has some weight. And the question is, what weight will we give uh, to machines? What weight will we give to everything that's in between machines and us as humans? And I think that's a really important question. And it's becoming a real question. And maybe we can uh, explore it um, with uh, our speakers. So thank you very, very much. Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Tobias Rees. I'm, I'm director of the Transformations of the Human program at the Berg Ruhn Institute. It's a, it's a pleasure to welcome you here. It's uh, an honor and a pleasure to welcome Agnieszka Kurant, an artist from New York, and Drew Andy, synthetic biologist from Stanford University, bioengineer. And we have set this up in, in the following manner. I'll briefly introduce the idea of the Berg Ruhn transformations of the human program, so that you know the context in which the three of us meet and talk. And then we have a conversation, the three of us. Actually, I'm just moderating, so I hope I talk as little as, as possible and let, let the two have as much fun as they possibly can. So, transformations of the human. I, I'd like to ask you to take a few seconds and to read these questions. So what, what is the human? Sounds like a funny question, like a huge and giant and big question. But the way in which we have answered these questions, or this question, what is a human being, seems to be outdated. So historically, we in the modern West have basically assumed that humans are, the concept of the human is stabilized by two differentiations, that humans are more than mere nature, and if you're set apart from animals and plants on the one hand, and then we are other or different from mere machines on the other side. So on the one side is the human, on the other side are animals and machines. The criterion of differentiation for this was that we humans have what animals and machines don't have, namely we have intelligence. Machines have mecha mechanics and animals have just instinct, so they're kind of enclosed. So this leads to a funny set of binaries or little couples where humans are intelligence, machines have instinct and mechanisms. Humans are free, we are not bound by instinct and mechanism, while animals and machines have necessity. We are subjects in a world composed of objects, we are thinking things in a world of mere things. If you think about the university, you see that there is a faculty of arts, 
which is concerned with the human only, and in fact it's concerned with the human in so far as it cannot be explained in terms of the natural sciences or engineering. It's this idea of the more and the other. And you have the faculty of science or engineering, which is concerned with everything else, everything else in the world, from you know squids in the ocean, to the formation of clouds, to global weather uh, systems, to rockets, to single cell organisms and minimally viable microbes, to termites. So we think that today, and that's the basic idea from our basic observation from which the transformations of the human program starts, today all of these distinctions or these two differentiations that we are more than nature and other than machine fail. I list microbiome because no one quite knows where a human being ends and its microbiome begins. The microbiome would be the number total of the microbes that live in and on your body. So, for example, most of the neurochemicals that we find in our brain, the brain that makes us, so to speak, are actually produced by bacteria living in our gut, which is a very funny, funny idea. Or synthetic biology, we'll talk a lot about this, the organisms that synthetic biology produces don't exist in nature, but they're perfectly natural, as if the distinction between nature and technology or nature and art don't, doesn't quite hold. We're, by any measure, not the only things in the universe that are intelligent. Animal intelligence research has sort of undermined this, and machines think today too and learn and have intelligence. So it's as if the vocabulary, the logic of the human that is implicit in the vocabulary that we have to think about ourselves as human, to experience ourselves as human, to make sense of ourselves as human, doesn't work anymore. That there are technical and scientific possibilities that have outgrown them. Oop. So we humans appear to be neither more than nature nor other than machine. And so the question is, what is the human? What is it that defines us now? So we designed the transformations of the human program as an effort to place philosophers and artists in science labs or in conversations with scientists in biology, but also in artificial intelligence, so that they together collectively study the understanding of the human or of the world that emerges from AI research, for example, or from biotech research, so that this is not an abstract, arbitrary question, what is the human, and everyone has a feeling or an opinion about it, but that we actually make science and technology visible as unfolding philosophical events. In that context, we have been working a lot, have been organizing conversations between artists and scientists like Agnieszka and Drew, who are an exemplary uh, conversation couple uh, pairing for what we hope to do and I hope that this exemplary quality becomes visible in the course of the conversation. So I'd, I'd like to, to start by simply asking Agnieszka how she did get interested in what she calls collective intelligences in kinds of multitudes that give rise to, to forms of intelligence or energy. Um, thank you, Tobias, and um, thank you, the Freeze team, for um, inviting us to be uh, part of this program. Um, so my work is somewhere at the crossover of um, questions that science, synthetic biology is asking, and AI research uh, is asking. And and I um, I've been thinking a lot about um, phenomena of collective intelligence and emergence in nature and in culture. And um, collective intelligence is a, um, is a phenomenon that happens in, in complex systems, uh, uh, systems such as society or the internet or the human brain. Um, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a property um, which um, um, emerges um, when new novel features um, um, appear and they are more than the sum of uh, the parts that constitute this system. And so for example, different social phenomena or uh, phenomena happening or crashes on this of the stock exchange or uh, consciousness is a as an emergent property of of, uh, of the human brain. Um, and uh, what is interesting for me is that these phenomena are so complex that are in, they are impossible to to plan and anticipate. Even with the algorithms that we um, have uh, nowadays, it's still very difficult to foresee for example, how a society is going to vote. So that's why these questions have been discussed widely when phenomena is Brexit or the 
the result of the uh, US elections um, happened, that, that even very complex algorithms that we're using um, are uh, failing at anticipating these very complex processes because, because uh, sometimes because in, in individuals uh, behave irrationally and this aggregated irrationality is difficult to, to calculate. Um, so I've been interested in, um, in this phenomenon of collective intelligence um, and uh, how um, the uh, development of algorithms and harvesting of our data is uh, 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 creating a situation of uh, what is now being called surveillance capitalism, where uh, our um, uh, data and our energies are being harvested by corporations who, who collect our data and who use this data to predict our future uh, behaviors and choices and and uh, feelings. But uh, I've, um, and this is being um, on the daily basis discussed in relationship to Facebook or or, or Google how our personal interactions or or uh, um, entertainment and joy are being harvested and how our data is being sold to advertising companies for, for profit. Um, so I've been thinking about these questions, um, but from the perspective of how uh, we could also maybe now as algorithms calculate our um, uh, uh, social capital, but in a positive sense, how the, the, the power of social capital is becoming um, more important nowadays than, um, than the financial capital, because we can uh, monetize likes and clicks, and this way uh, so social energies become part of the energy market in a similar way as oil and gas are. So um, so I've been working, for example, on collective signatures that I developed for various groups of people, um, uh, for social movements, like you can see here on, on the facade of the Guggenheim Museum uh, and the facade of the uh, Cleveland Museum of Art. Uh, uh, so uh, I developed these collective signatures for uh, for social movements, for uh, labor unions, for uh, also for visitors of museums. Um, and um, uh, what I uh, what I'm doing in these projects is like I, I developed an algorithm that allows for aggregation and um, uh, fu fusion of signatures of thousands of people into one collective signature. And uh, contemporary science. Uh, um, um, allows us to to examine um, a co a collective um, intelligence of a termite colony, for example, um, and. Uh, um, realize that uh, desperate um, um, termite colonies have separate individual collective personalities. So one could say that a one um, termite colony is like a collective person. And the same can be told about a uh, social movement. So for example, one social movement collectively becomes different uh, from, from another one, even though they may represent the same program, because these are very complex emergent properties that, that appear. So I've been uh, developing these collective signatures um, for for various uh, communities, and um, I've been also thinking about the future uh, future of labor and the, the the future of work, the post work, when we're thinking about automation and uh, the transformations that that uh, uh, the labor market is undergoing, and how collective intelligence could play um, into that. So there is this whole new platform that Amazon uh, started called the Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is basically the beginning of a new working class and. Mm, this platform um, uh, creates a situation of a uh, gigantic uh, dispersed social factory where uh, workers all over the globe uh, do very small tasks uh, online and these tasks are in various ways uh, a part of a larger project that none of the workers is uh, um, aware of. So uh, this is becoming a pretty exploitative system very often because the workers are remunerated very often un under one dollar per hour. So um, so what I what I what I did was this um, uh, whole phenomenon of the transformation of the of the labor market of the of the of the working class as well uh, that we are starting to witness is I try to apply it to art production and. Mm, I, um, um, I I um, collaborated with um, uh, again um, AI scientists and computer programmers uh, uh, to to create um, algorithms that that would um, enable aggregation of different inputs of uh, thousands of workers around the globe to produce artworks. So, for example, um, uh, this series of works uh, which um, I developed uh, with my partner John John Manick, an artist and writer. It's called Production Line. Uh, 
and uh, each of the workers um, uh, um, who logs into the Amazon uh, platform um, is asked to simply draw a, a line with their computer mouse. But then these lines are aggregated into complex drawings that are outputted to a pen plotter and then they are uh, they they turn into this kind of aggregated labor of thousands of people. Um, and what is most important is that um, we created a mechanism that allows for profit sharing. So all these anonymous workers around the globe, once a work gets sold, um, uh, the, the, uh, a portion of the, of the profit is distributed among, among the workers. So each of these images you see is, is, is representing a kind of aggregated social capital or aggregated labor of, of thousands of, of people. So in a way, it's the kind of like a uh, um, cheeky or, or almost cynical way of, of siphoning uh, of the money from the art market uh, to to distribute it among uh, anonymous workers around the globe, and how can you connect the the very top, the pinnacle of 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 the um, of the art market and of, of what the surplus values uh, from the art market um, uh, um, creates to to the anonymous workers and uh, that are completely alienated from their product, but one day wake up to to receive. $25 bonus um, in the middle of Bangladeshi village, for example. And uh, this this project is uh, uh, um, uh, developing it uh, further. This is called um, assembly line um, and uh, um, 10,000 uh, um, workers online submitted their self-portraits and they were aggregated into this composite uh, collective self-portrait of um, workers um, um, of this new working class. Um, and uh, this is a series um, called um, Artificial Interface artificial intelligence, AAI, and um, also related to the question that uh, Tobias asked about the, the collective intelligence, because termites are a very interesting species. Um, it's it's an example of emergence and collective intelligence in nature. So each of these mounds is built by uh, a society, one can say, uh, of, of at, um, at least a million termites. And termites form um, worker societies. So this means that this, these social structures are stratified. They, they, they create working, uh, they are working classes. They are divided into classes of soldiers, nurses, workers, and, and um, farmers. And they build these monumentally looking structures that uh, strangely resemble uh, pyramids or, or temples that human civilizations um, erect. So what I did is, um, I, in a similar manner that I was um, outsourcing uh, my art production to thousands of people working online, here I'm outsourcing my my artworks to millions of of termites, um, and so I provide the termites with um, um, broken crystals, colored vividly colored uh, sands and gold particles and uh, they uh, each of these uh, colonies is isolated and they just work for about three four months and then at the end this is the result and so they are basically this kind of complex uh, hybrid structures hovering between nature and culture and in a way um, uh, I'm, I'm looking I'm, I'm thinking about this 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 uh, uh, project um, as models of this like society as a dispersed factory where in a way we are all termites and we're constantly working on this um, global conveyor belt where our data is being harvested and, and sold and we don't even know when and how and um, and in a similar manner these termites who are almost blind they don't notice that they are actually producing something different from their original houses and um, and also like the, the, the each of them yeah like this the, each colony develops this um, um, uh, one form that that uh, then becomes um, my product, my, my 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 artwork, and this project also relates to another thing that that I'm exploring in my practice, which is the notion of authorship and how, in contemporary um, times, it's um, uh, it has to be questioned because uh, 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 in the times of Wikipedia, for example, where um, knowledge is produced collectively, where there are many contributors and not just one author of, a, of the encyclopedia, we have to also rethink art and culture uh, because, in fact, uh, certain uh, co very important cultural products, such as the Bible or the mythologies, they were collectively authored by uh, 
thousands uh, of anonymous unknown uh, humans and uh, and today the authorship is something that has been extremely fetishized especially in the art market and maybe the future of, of culture maybe the future of humanity belongs to um, a, a complex um, collective forms well, you know I'm, I'm actually very curious about this listening to you now just the insight of a termite mound I think so w one way of thinking about what we've just heard is to assume that we use the termites as a kind of metaphor. There basically are uh, questions of, so if, if you think of a classical corporation, the most important signature in that building will be the person at the top, the CEO or the president. While there would be no corporation or no, no company with all the people who work in that company. So when you build a collective signature, that's also a form of social critique or a social commentary on that company. And what Agnieszka said about the Amazon Mechanical Turk fits that, fits that bill that there is a social critique. And now you, you look at termites and you use termites as a kind of metaphor to offer a social commentary, the sort of critical of capitalism, critical of the way in which wealth is redistributed or not in, in a country. Another way of thinking about this is to say there are collectives, termites, you could think of a flock of starlings and the murmuration, you could think of bacteria, Agnieszka works with slime molds, so which is basically a group of bacteria. And these, these bacteria will at one point sort of engage in a, in a massive feast called quorum sensing, which is very similar to the starlings that fly all together wild and they seem to not bump into each other. You think of cars at the Arc de Triomphe in, in, in Paris where you know all the cars go in circle and it's completely unordered, yet it works. You think of termites, humans, birds, bacteria. Then you have a series of collectives and a form of, of organization that seems to be not controlled by anyone. And once you have this series of collectives, Siri wants to participate. <laughs> <laughs> Did you actually ac accidentally summon me? <laughs> Call it collective intelligence. Um, or surveillance capitalism. Um, then you, so then, then the old. So when you when you recall how I started uh, the conversation or how I explained the transformations of the human program, that the old distinction between w humans on the one side and animals, machines, or plants on the other side seems to not fa seems to fail, seems to not work anymore. Then there is sort of a series of kinds of collectives, all of which have collective signatures, all of which have collective intelligences. There seems to be no one at the top that organizes this. And then humans are one entry in a series from slime molds to birds to computers to cars and no longer set apart as something special. So this is, this is one of the things that I find extremely intriguing about, Agnieszka, uh, about Agnieszka's work. It does, it's almost a kind of elaboration of a, of a different kind or possibility of thinking about what it means to be human when the juxtaposition of human and nature fails and when we are just one entrance into a series. When intelligence is no longer what sets us apart because we might not be individually intelligent but as a collective. And, and um, I do think that Drew's work as synthetic biologist also runs diagonal to many, of the distinction, to many of the distinctions that we have traditionally relied on, for example, nature and technology, or the natural and the artificial. I was wondering. Yeah, so hi. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of just a straightforward engineer here, so let's acknowledge a couple things. One, Tobias is exploiting us because he has a hypothesis, which is that the operating system for our culture needs to be reconstructed. And I think he's right. And I'm very grateful to be exploited in that sense. And so in a way, my job is to um, express some dimensions of ambiguity coming from the life sciences and biotechnology, if you will. And if you could just either click or click on my behalf. Um, here's a piece I exhibited in the Serpentine of all places in Hyde Park accidentally. It's part of a piece. And, and this is a, 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 a simple schematic of, of what I call lineage land. Biology, as we're familiar with it, typically descends directly from one generation to the next. An egg and a sperm making a zygote and a new human. And if it reproduces again with another from one generation to the next, whether bacteria, mammal, fish, plant, um, so it goes. And now, of course, there's diversity in evolution and selection. What's shown here is just a particular lineage 
changing over time. We're all operating within the constraint of lineage land. So one thing I could bring to the table is, could we ever imagine leaving lineage land? And if so, how would we do it and when might we do it? I have some, I'd like to call these paints, but they're not, they're really inks. These are jars of ink and uh, there's four different jars and they're invisible ink. In each of the jars is one of the four nucleotides or bases of DNA, a jar of A, T, C, or G. And um, they're not derived, the molecules in these jars, from pre-existing molecules of DNA. Rather, they're made from sugar and sugar cane that's then modified via synthetic chemistry to make a type of dry powder that's in the jars in grams quantities. And, and each jar costs about $250. So it's about $1,000 worth of ink. And you hook these ink containers into a printer that's not printing on paper, but is dispensing the chemicals in a particular order to make from scratch whatever molecule of DNA you'd like to instantiate. So this is called DNA synthesis. And it's a technology where the chemistry, the ink, was perfected by 1980, but the industrialization and organization of the printing capacity really only got going over the last 15 or so years. So for example, when I first started teaching at MIT in 2003, if we wanted to, you can think of this as a four key keyboard where the keys are A, T, C, G, and you press them in whatever order you wish. T, A, A, T, A, C, G, A, C, T, C, A, C, T, A, T, A, G, 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 A, G, A, right? Um, in 2003, pressing the key once cost four bucks to get one letter printed into a polymer, a custom polymer. Today, it's two cents. So that's what 200X cost down, and it's like compute gets better, DNA printing gets better, DNA reading gets better as well. Now these inks are invisible because when you print into it, you just get this tiny little polymer that doesn't do anything unless you place it in a living context and then the living context will try to express the operations encoded in the DNA. So that sequence I was rattling off causes genes to be expressed. Um, okay, so what? Um, well, here's another representation of how biology could exist in space and time, if you will, you could take a lineage and at one point read it out, decoding its physical genetic material into information that could be represented as digital information and transited over the internet. And then somewhere else, sometime else, you could compile it back and reinstantiate the lineage, removing a fundamental constraint in nature, which is the constraint of direct descent through lineage. If you're thinking about techno-economic culture, it means you can instantiate biology wherever you could print the DNA, right? So you can combine the biology with the network, making a biological network. These are two fundamental ambiguities, the decoupling from lineage and the disconnect from location and time to another location and time. What can you do with this type of stuff? So these are E. coli that have been engineered by teenagers to take genetic instructions in colorless DNA but cause the bacteria to make pigments. So the students called this Escherichia chromi. And this was done in Cambridge, England over a decade ago. You have the red colored E. coli on the left and the purple colored E. coli on the right. Um, you now have living bacterial pigments where each cell is about a micron. If you could paint with these, right? You'd have micron pointillism all over the place. The nerds who did this work, well, we don't know what to do with this type of stuff. We can't conceptualize what people might wish for with this technology. The colleagues we found at the time at the Royal College of Art looked at this and imagined a future in which people would wish for probiotic yogurts where that you could ingest and then there'd be genetic sensors in your gut microbes and depending on the health of your gut, what would come out of you would be colored depending on which specialist you should see or how you should change your nutrition. They, they, they put a number on this which was 2049, not being the price of the product, but the year they thought our culture would be ready for the microbial culture so to speak. You know, how many people would be happy to have therapeutic bacteria all over the place? Um, I just want to offer a reflect. So I, I want it's, it's a type of ambiguity around moving beyond lineage, which we can come back to, but just making arbitrary things in biology. I'll offer a reflection on the, the ambiguity between the artificial and the natural, if you will. Um, here's the best example of explicit corporate advertising I can find on the Stanford campus. 
Um, it's in the covered arcade around the uh, historical quad in the middle of the campus. And that's where we put the good stuff, these nice blocks of um, diamond-shaped pavers made by George Goodman in the late 19th century, the artificial stone. Um, so it's such an interesting uh, imprint for me because it immediately uh, suggests that artificial is not a pejorative. Uh, just over 100 years ago, Art artificial is a point of pride for branding and marketing. It's the good stuff. And, and then the other lesson it brings to me is, well, what is artificial stone? And, and what might that teach me about other things I might make, including living things? Um, it turns out that artificial stone is related to natural stone. It's natural stone that goes beyond a, a, a historical process of regularization supporting coordination of labor, but the grinding up of the stone itself to make stone of a new form with new properties that we wish for very quickly, um, which we're familiar with now. And we're surrounded and comfortable with operating inside artificial stone systems all the time. So could you imagine, for example, ever getting a mature oak tree not in 72 years, but in 72 hours. How would you begin to think about that? Well, one traditional biological lineage land approach would be you're going to add a whole bunch of morphogens and accelerants to get it to grow faster. But the lesson of artificial stone might be you'd grind up a tree and remake a tree, maybe in partnership with some mushrooms and some other things that get figured out along the way. It also implies two other things. One that we don't have to change the fundamental molecules of the biology very much to make new things, but also that we can make entirely new artifacts. It's very hard to conceptualize what a new artifact is in biology besides a derivative artifact, making version two of something, making a minimum form of something. But we're now at a point where I can offer the undergraduate classes 10 million base pairs of DNA synthesis for a semester-based course. That's enough to encode yeast. Uh, we're within striking distance of getting to 100 million base pairs of DNA synthesis for the student projects. That's a fly or a worm. What else could you make at that scale? I don't know. I don't know how to think about organisms without constraint to lineage. I'll end with just one provocation, which is mm, old in a way, but meant to relate something about what I'll call urgency. I think there is this uh, opportunity to Consider a construction of an operating system for a culture, if you will, and it's very hard to have that conversation. I think the Berger and program is the only thing I've encountered that's not just the connection of art, science, and engineering, but also philosophy and humanity, literally, which is completely improbable and not seen anywhere else. So here's the last slide from me. Uh, this is the final exam from Introduction to Bioengineering at Stanford four years ago. It's a course I teach in the spring. And um, we're very generous with our grading. If you put your name on the test, you get two, per two points. Um, but so here's the first question. Just bear with me. It's, it's trying to give you a sense of pacing. And there's so much uncertainty around this. I don't want you to take this literally, but, but I'll, we'll get to a qualitative outcome. So as I mentioned, the price of printing DNA is dropping. You just look at that too. The price of printing DNA is dropping by about a factor of two every other year. And we have another trend, which isn't a good one. The price of going to Stanford is increasing. And it doubles about every 15 years, it looks like, over the recent history. Um, so if you take these two trends, and then you say, well, if a human genome is 4 billion letters, and the price of printing that DNA is dropping, and the price of going to Stanford is going up, at what year from now, what year in the future, will the cost of printing the DNA and coding the entirety of a human genome in a way that is not constrained by lineage, not editing, none of that stuff, just print it. When will that cost as much as going to Stanford for a year? And just do the math. Because right, it's an engineering course, so we want them to do some math. And um, the answer is 2036, which sounds like a long time from now. It is. But the argument I'll offer is it's less than one human generation from now. And Current trends continuing are totally not to be taken for granted. There's a lot of ambiguity in terms of what's going to happen, in other words. But I think that the, the game is afoot, in other words, 
think it's consider what does it mean to be human? What do we wish for for the rest of the living things on the planet? What's our relationship with them? And so on and so forth. Just to give you a little bit of, I don't know if this is comfort or not, but just to share so I don't get in too much trouble back on the farm. There is a follow-up question on the exam, which didn't have room on this slide, which has to do with what do you decide to do? If you and a future partner imagine that you might wish to have kids someday, do you start saving up for tuition for college or to print their DNA? And most, like 98% of the class gets this part of the question right, and we grade it on the math. But the second question, we just grade on reasoning, not the answer. Just did you reason to an answer? And it splits the class. 60% of the class says, this is not what it means to be a human. It's not what it would mean to be a parent. No way. Um, and 40% of the class say Stanford's overrated, cost basis of education is going to change, Khan Academy 12.0 will be there. And if there's any chance I can secure an advantage into my lineage, ironically, into my lineage, then I want to get that option. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Agnieszka. <clears throat> so, Don, but the discussion is only starting. <laughs> A little later. So, just one point, want to point out one sort of technical thing and then ask a set of philosophical questions or share a set of philosophical observations. But one thing that Drew pointed out is that is, this is synthesizing. This is not gene editing. When you gene edit, you ultimately stay within lineage land, right? You edit the genome of your kid that, uh, or uh, when you do IVF or so, so you stay within lineage land. There are the two parents, and then you edit one gene uh, or multiple, and then the baby's born. So synthetic biology is really a rupture with this two parents, one child, two parents, one child, etc. You can sort of create from scratch. But here, here, is, here is a philosophical observation that I think can, can lead to a discussion, and that is, if you recall that I started with what is a human being and this idea that humans are set apart from mere nature, one of the points of pride, which I think the stone about artificial intelligence nicely showed, is that humans can build stuff that doesn't exist in nature, that is sort of set apart from nature. When we use the term culture, we usually mean something, or historically at least we have met something, that is not found in nature and that therefore sets us apart from animals and, and machines. When we have cultural history or cultural anthropology, it's this stuff that, as if there were a separate human reality. And of course, that, the artificial in the late 19th century, when engineering was at its prime time and pride, what was better than the natural because the natural is wild, is untamed, is defunct, is, is sort of primitive, whereas the artificial is refined. So when you take something like synthetic biology, and Drew once said to me that the currently existing life forms are not even the snowflake on the tip of possible life forms, on the, uh, not even the snowflake on the tip of the iceberg of possible life forms. And you think about the possibility of, of printing genomes and putting them into cells and the kinds of organisms that don't exist at all that you could build. We had a conversation about dragons, which may sound funny, but actually it could be possible, right? So then you have a whole series of beings in the world that are entirely natural. They're totally natural, but they don't, they don't happen to exist in nature. So what happens to that distinction between technology and nature that we usually rely on, that we operate with when we enter post-lineage land? What is a human being when we enter post-lineage land? These, the distinctions or the vocabularies that we have available seem to no longer work. And that's, that's exactly where I think that there is a sort of interface between Agnieszka's work and Drew's work. Agnieszka actually explores possibilities of thinking diagonally to the old distinctions. And, and, and Drew's work is opening up spaces where the old distinctions no longer work. So that, to explore that space is, is our goal. I didn't trigger them. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, what is important for me in, in, in my work, and, and we're discussing this um, a lot at the Brookerin Institute, uh, is is how uh, this uh, disruptions that happen, such as the the the, the invention of, of CRISPR or uh, automation. Um, 
AI research, how um, our models that we, uh, our social, political, economic models that we inherited from from the past, they are simply inadequate to to deal with with these disruptions, with this new uh, phenomena, discoveries, developments, and uh, and we have to uh, create uh, new models, new kind of scaffold. Uh, new vocabulary new toolkit to to not only talk about this but to think to think about this with new uh with with was almost like a new 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 logic to kind of reconstruct our uh worldview from from scratch and uh this is what i am trying to do in my work and this is why uh these conversations at the Berggren Institute have been so uh, interesting for me because this is what we're doing here. We're trying to discuss how can we just rebuild from scratch uh, everything that that uh, all these notions that uh, that were used. How we, maybe we can discard of these notions. So, for example, the the, the notion of, of 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 human nature and and technology. Just to give you an example, the um, the way that 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 uh, contemporary. Uh, both science and culture uh, uh, thinks about the n uh, notion of uh, AI. First of all, the term artificial intelligence. What is artificial today? As 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 uh, Tobias and Drew pointed out, it, the very term artificial is kind of suspicious because we now know that artificial is not really artificial. Maybe it's natural, um, and uh, also. Uh, Culture seems to very often anthropomorphize uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So this idea of like a future supercomputer is understood as a as a single individual uh, mind. Uh, but actually, in, in reality, intelligence is always distributed. Cognition is distributed in society, in termite colonies, in in the human uh, brain or outside the brain, in bacterial colonies. So um, uh, so the way that we have to like uh, think about the future. Uh, intelligence, future AI, it is uh, more likely to be more of a network, of a, of a, of a distributed uh, network of not only machines, but possibly humans with machines as with, and with other organisms uh, as well. Drew, you, you said that what you enjoy about the Berkman Institute is that there is not just an encounter between arts and science, but that philosophy and humanities are also part of it. Why, why do you think that that's actually important for the exploration of post-lineage land? You could start with the question of um, what does it mean to be human? Uh, and and, and um, you know, I think you've correctly diagnosed that the separation of the human and everything else from the 17th century playing out was a good hack four centuries ago, but has gotten to a point where a type of deficit, two, two types of deficits are accumulating at least. Um, one is the natural sciences and engineering have now progressed to a point where we can directly assert our intention into the human lineage. So by default, we are posing and answering the question what it means to be human without being well equipped to do either. Um, it's very interesting, for example, to see how quickly the transition to um, prenatal diagnosis on the basis of DNA sequence information deployed in the children's hospital on campus. So for, for my two kids, the older one, now five, you couldn't get the DNA sequence from the mother's blood while pregnant unless you knew the lab who developed the technique and walked it over to the lab and said, hey, Steve, could you do this? Um, but with our two-year-old, standard of care. Everybody is clamoring for it because it's actually better uh, in terms of quality of data. But, but so literally by default, we've embraced the first part of Gattaca, without having the conversation about that, yet we know it, and, and it's shiny, happy stuff. Um, so that's, that's one part of it. Um, it keeps going, as you pointed out, the ongoing um, experiences with editing directly within the lineage, both in the United States, Sweden, and China, and elsewhere. And then this is a provocation into the next generation more extreme. But then there's another deficit, which is the deficit having balkanized the human from nature, how do we think about that thing, the nature? Over my lifetime, it looks like the human population's doubled and the metrics of natural biodiversity have halved. Should I care about that or not? If I were to be very, very selfish, one way I'd care about it is because I can't invent any molecular gizmo to do the bioengineering I want, I have to borrow it or inherit it from nature. I have to be a frontline defender of natural biodiversity. 
because any time an organism goes extinct in nature, I lose an entire part kit, a set of tools I might use. And so that's a bummer. <laughs> so it's in my selfish interest to preserve biodiversity. Um, the conservation biology community connecting with the biotechnology community almost out of desperation now to try and figure out not how do we get back to 1850 or 1950, but how do we get to 2050 on this earth with a, a natural biodiversity roster we are happy about is a very interesting conversation. And it's quite, as you might expect, a struggle within both tribes to forge the literacy, but also manage the cultural politics of that. So, so now you bring that back to, say, um, our beloved institutions like Stanford. In my limited experience, institutions represent the state of the art from when they were set up. The engineering school at Stanford was set up in 1925, and so we rec represent that state of the art in terms of thinking and society, where you could innovate technology and ship with impunity. We know that that doesn't work so well all the time anymore, but it's quite a struggle within the institution to architect relationships and just have the conversations to begin to struggle to figure out what we might do differently. Right. So I, I want to dwell on this for a second and invite Agnieszka to join me thinking about this from an arts or humanities perspective. So w one thing that Drew said is that we also have to think about the other side or what was once the other side, as it were, nature, uh, which for mo so when, when one usually problematizes that humans were set apart from the natural world, one imagines that that was kind of a mistake and we have destroyed nature and that's all kind of true. But simultaneously, nature in that in that context is then often evoked as the original, as the good, as this where we are all coming from, as the opposite of the technical or of the human. But then you have something like CRISPR, which is gene editing, not synthetic biology, but still CRISPR is a tool, but this tool was not invented by humans, it was invented by bacteria three and a half billion years ago. So it's almost as if uh, CRISPR itself dissolved this, di dissolves this distinction between nature and technology. And you have, you have a tool that is actually a living, natural piece. Sure, we, d we use it to certain ends, but there's nothing unnatural about it. And so you, then you, you uh, go back to what, what Truth said, namely this possibility of, of synthesizing DNA and of putting it in cells and creating new organisms that don't exist in nature. That's a form of technology that is entirely natural. So now you look back at the mid 20th century concept of industry or technology and you say, oh wow, this idea that technology is non-natural, that it's artificial and set apart, might have ac actually have been a misunderstanding. It might have been a mistake. Maybe nature and technology are not at all at odds with one another. Maybe there is actually a straightforward continuum. Maybe technology and industry are natural. So then you go, you know, then you, you enter a terrain that is so turbulent and so difficult to understand from a traditional 19th century perspective that organizes to university. I mean, when, when, when you send your kids today to Stanford, they go probably either into the Faculty of Arts, where they learn about the human and how wonderful the human is, and about culture and, and, and cultural history and gr Greece or rituals elsewhere. And, or you send them to the faculty of science or engineering where they learn about DNA and molecules, etc. But that there is a link between the two, that the discoveries that people make in the faculty of science or engineering actually undermine the whole concept of the human on which the faculty of arts is based is nowhere ever discussed. And if you discuss it, the faculty of arts hates you, of course, because you, know, you, you question the legitimacy of it. And that seems only on the surface of things as if one naively embraces science as the really cool thing, because what actually happens is that science comes into view as a kind of philosophical enterprise where new notions of the human, new notions of nature, new notions of technology are elaborated. And I, I, think, I think we all think, I think Nick, Nicholas has allowed us to build this program because we all agree on this, just in this moment where we seem to be capable to depart from lineage land, where we enter this highly ambiguous open space where uncertainty rules about what we should do, all we have are 19th century concepts. And there is this big open wide and we, we actually have no clue quite what to do it and we, we call for limits and we call for regulations and we call for norms. But maybe a much more interesting thing to do is to be open towards this future, even if it's uncertain, and to bring together artists and scientists and philosophers and engage in a conversation for how to think differently and give positive shape rather than just negatively limiting or inhibiting the possibilities that we have. W would it be fair to say that one 
one can read your work as an exploration of these of these open spaces of providing a kind of imaginary for how to navigate these uncertain open spaces uh, yes, I, 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 I think that maybe this is a good moment to show the video because I wanted to, I don't know if we can, is it? Uh, yeah. Oh, perfect. Thank you. So this is actually an example of, of a work of mine that, that uh, kind of runs across uh, the, the, the questions that that, that you're, you're asking. This is called Animal Internet. And uh, uh, it relates to a, to a phenomenon that emerged um, out of you know, interactions between technology, internet, uh, uh, exploration of nature, uh, 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 the, the extinction, and, and other uh, voices in society. So uh, about 50,000 animals worldwide uh, are being tagged with, uh, um, with chips and are being followed on different tracker devices nowadays. And, uh, and a lot of scientists started installing cameras in jungles and in like the remote areas like the North Pole uh, to, for, for, uh, to watch animals that are living in the wild. And so what you see is in the um, upper right corner and the bottom left corner are two real webcams that, uh, that that were placed by scientists and these animals are completely wild quote unquote they are not aware of the presence of this of the of a camera and uh, uh, there's this so th this phenomenon of animal internet is about how people start ordinary people have started following these animals online the this uh, completely wild animals now have Facebook pages fan pages they have names and and they are living this parallel uh, lives or augmented reality of sorts they are kind of they are wild in their own environment but meanwhile they they are called john or jack and they are like followed and have like this millions of followings so 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 what i uh, when i realized this is that you know this is uh, this kind of race for like co colonization of nature but still we need this uh, areas or continents of wilderness but they are shrinking obviously so maybe what is the future of the something formerly called as nature which would here trying to deconstruct together with Drew and, and, and Tobias. Uh, maybe the future of nature is that ev when everything is in the, uh, everything wild is already conquered, we're gonna have to manufacture nature as we're already doing with synthetic biology. So these two other webcams that you see, they are, uh, uh, one is of, a, they are both um, engineered at MIT that uh, uh, this, uh, I, I, I worked with, uh, um, uh, roboticists and AI scientists, and the one in the um, upper left corner is uh, is an animatronic animal with artificial fur uh, uh, created all for the webcam, and uh, it's this animal is kind of powered by aggregated behavior of uh, protest movements around the globe and whatever they are, they are tweeting. So the, the the AI was parsing the the, the, the tw Twitter feeds of of all these protest movements, and then it was uh, translated into into behavior of this animal. And uh, um, and the 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 other the, the one in the uh, uh, bottom left uh, uh, corner is uh, uh, based on different comments sent by by. Uh, uh, the workers on the Amazon Mechanical Turk, so different people working online, they, they felt how they feel, and this was translated into this aggregated uh, swarm of gerbils. And so, uh, but, but both these cameras are uh, uh, mingled with, with other real cameras, so whoever like, uh, is just an enthusiast of this animal internet, because that's the, what this phenomenon is called, they won't see the difference, because they're just uh, uh, engaging with these uh, mediated images, and they just want to be in nature, but they are too scared to go to the forest, so they just, I mean, uh, watching watching these animals. So, um, so for me, you know, it's uh, I'm trying to construct environments that 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 are uh, uh, maybe to some degree science fiction, but actually they are already happening. And I I think that we are living in uh, very terrifying times, but also super interesting times. That a as we speak, like uh, uh, we can see the evolution of of of, uh, of us as a species. We can see uh, how uh, every single category that we imagine, such as nature, culture, technology technology is is changing and and no longer means and maybe is completely obsolete and i've uh, I'm, I'm trying to just pinpoint situations through my work that 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 dismantled this um, process great thank you so much so i i think we we um, have about 15 or 20 minutes to ask 
for a Q&A period. So if you have questions, there are people walking around with microphones. Please, please briefly raise your hand. Explore post-lineage land and, and AI-based gerbils with us. Hi. <laughs> Drew, I'd love to ask you about, um, and this touches on, the, on the, the work both of you talked about, sort of the idea of collective intelligence, of um, machines, humans communicating and then acting as a, a collective brain or a sort of computing machine. I guess the, the biggest barrier, it seems, to being able to do that is networking and communication. Um, humans communicate with machines in a very inefficient way today humans communicate with each other in a very inefficient way. Um, and it'd be interesting from a sort of a synthetic biology and bioengineering perspective to sort of get your views on how humans and machines will communicate and whether we're seeing any sort of bioengineering that would allow machines and humans to communicate. I mean, you know, we're, I guess I'm imagining a, an avatar-like world where um, we're all interconnected um, and it would strike me that, that we're not actually that far away from that if we could sort of bioengineer ourselves um, to have that interface. Th thanks so much for the question. Um, the, the, the complexity of a collective behavior is a function of both bandwidth between the agents in the collective and state within each individual agent. And so, for example, if you had a very limited channel for communication, could only communicate infrequently and sparsely, but yet infinite state, as time goes to infinity, you could reach arbitrary complexities. But when you're competing in the time space, to your point, very astutely, you have to have a lot of bandwidth to communicate between the different agents. Um, the, the specific technical area you're asking about is not one I work in directly, but I'm immediately proximal to through colleagues in the bioengineering department and DARPA programs and commercial activities all over the place. So the one way of thinking about it would be just brain-human interface um, for the human uh, side of it. And it's, on the one hand, uh, incredibly crude. Uh, you see um, arrays of electrical terminals, you know, placed into the nervous system of a human. Um, but they keep getting better, and even though it seems like it's a total mismatch of length scale relative to the resolution of a nervous system, how the neurons are linked up, you can use AI algorithms to basically train the person and the signal processing to develop the interface. And what's happening within patients right now is just remarkable. So you could have a patient who is um, completely paralyzed, but able to, with a human machine interface implanted uh, electrically, if you will, transduced sufficient to operate a keyboard and type. Um, and you know, so we're seeing things like that reported routinely in the on-campus seminars, in the clinical settings, in the hospitals. And you then see the ambitions of the publicly funded programs that are trying to uh, prevent surprise around future technologies by pushing the limits. And then I presume people who track the space follow things like, what is it, Neuralink or other private investments. Um, how far does this go? Uh, seems like it could go as far as you want to push it. The, the flip side of that I'd offer for consideration, and I don't know how to merge the two, is some work from Carl Pabo, who has thought about how people think as they communicate and puts forward an argument that basically people have been selected to represent what they experience in four chunks, where within your mind or consciousness at any moment, you can really only keep track of four different things. And so if you're trying to operate within a context you're experiencing, you might swap out the thing you're thinking about one of the four at a time. But that's pretty much what you can deal with. And so when you go to communicate with somebody else, you may have in your mind a much richer diversity of ideas and concepts that are not so chunkified. But in getting it from one person to the other person, you have to make them explicit in these four chunks. And there's this very stringent narrowing of the bandwidth. I don't know if Carl's right or not, but it makes a lot of sense to me because it's a 
type of diagnosis for why it's hard for us individually to confront increasingly complicated topics and figure out what to do about them because it just sort of overwhelms what we've been optimized for over evolutionary time to deal with individually. So on the one hand, I would agree that the technology is moving out and it's seemingly primitive in almost a, a 19th century way, yet powered up and working by these new algorithms. And I can't believe it works, and it works. Um, and people seem to like it when it works, and the money's flowing to make it better. So I would expect that continues. What I can't figure out is whether or not it'll ever like Avatar or Neo in the Matrix, get rid of this fundamental bottleneck around communication such that you could just do the poof, massively parallel push of concepts and get it. And I, I don't know if you get rid of that bandwidth constraint. I don't, I don't know. I think anything about that would probably just be speculation. Just to, to follow on with a, a question, I, I guess it looks like all, all the approaches to the problem seem to be electronic, yeah. right? We're, we're building electrodes and various tools. <laughs> Have you seen any approaches that are more biological? I mean, could you bioengineer a bacteria to modulate a magnetic field to communicate? Totally, with totally. Systems? Right. Yeah, so absolutely great. So, so a lot of times people look at Moore's law and they interpret it as technology is increasing with a certain pacing, and you have to anticipate where it's going to be. But the but the secondary lesson of Moore's law, which I think is more powerful, is better technology begets better technology. And so what's happening in biotechnology is the biotechnology is getting better biotechnology. The significance of CRISPR is it's a biological technology for operating on biology, which will make it easier to develop the next generation of biological technologies. And, and so you're starting to see this autocatalytic cycle playing out in an accelerating way around the toolkit for biology. So could you have a genetically encoded living matter to dope silicon matter information transducer, and the existence proofs are all over the place, right? So you have magnetobacteri magnetotactic bacteria that make 60, man 60 nanometer magnet crystals at, at environmental conditions in the ocean. Um, you've got optogenetics that Carl and colleagues at Stanford developed for doing light to genetics transduction. Um, yeah, so it, it, this, these things eventually become genetically encoded would be the prediction. I think that's right. I think that's also wonderful. So I think this is a wonderful example for the kind of biologization of technology that we that we talked about partly. One way of going about building a brain uh, machine interface is to basically rely on early 20th century electrophysiology where you know that there are certain brain parts that are responsible for motor movements. You sort of standardize the neural impulses that are emerging from that brain part and you translate them directly into a machine so that the keyboard can be activated through a kind of device that sits basically here, but it's purely electrophysiology. And, and uh, actually fusing on the single cell level, bacteria for example, but not only bacteria, T cells or whatever uh, other people are doing in synthetic biology, and make them into kinds of living mini computers that are not in silico but that are DNA based. That's that's a wide and open frontier. Can I can I, can I give you a, a distributed intelligence computer for a second? So so right now on the planet, there's this computer operating in bacteria in nature where the bacteria get infected by viruses, and the viruses that infect bacteria are the most abundant reproducing systems on Earth. There's ten to the thirty one of them. It's estimated. Uh, so there's 10 to the 10th people, roughly. There's 10 to the 21 times more of these bacterial viruses. And about 10 to the 25th times each second, a uh, decision is being made in an infected bacteria to either burst and release more of these viruses or go dormant and maybe pop up later. And it's a digital switching event. So every second on Earth, there's 10 to the 25th digital switching events happening in quote unquote nature. Um, so whose intelligence is that? And how would you operate or exploit the surplus labor of the bacterial viruses? <laughs> well, I mean, this this uh, uh, pretty much like, uh, brings us to the, to the, to the uh, thought that um, uh, if um, our immune system, um, as we know, is, is um, um, 
uh, regulated by bacteria, then uh, the the idea of what is self and what is non-self is no longer applies because you know we have external elements being part part of of our um, selfhood. Uh, but um, I think it was in, in response to your question as well. I think that what is uh, really interesting uh, today is that it, it's become possible to convert uh, uh, information into matter and uh, in various ways or into energy uh, and in, in biology as uh, this is happening uh, through what Drew was talking about but in in terms of um, uh, AI uh, uh, harvesting information about um, about us um, it uh, and harvesting uh, social energies our you know our enthusiasm our anger uh, our um, uh, our joy uh, these are real emotions that are actually by chemical processes that happen in our bodies and our brains uh, but then they manifest themselves through different kind of data from us what we like what we click online and then it can be harvested and, and it's being monetized and of course it's a negative uh, process but maybe the same things uh, as I was trying to point out could be used also in positive ways you know that we can um, understand what is our the power of our aggregated aggregated social capital or of our aggregated social enthusiasm and uh, but the very fact that these things become uh, interconvertible between energy uh, information and matter this is like a total revolution I think we have time for one more question Hello, everyone. My name is Sebastian Arcel. I'm an international relations sophomore at Loyola Marymount University. Um, my question is, how does policy, since I study how policy, I, I'm, I'm an international relations, so I study uh, policy at the international level. What are the policy implications of um, what you've referred to as a uh, post-linear society? What, what's the policy of the termites? <laughs> uh, uh, well, the, 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 precisely the reason why uh, our work uh, seems to be uh, relevant is because we don't have these models. We're, we're currently trying to, to, to discuss like how to how to respond to this new uh, developments because you know th there's a question of whether some of these things should be re regulated or all of these uh, changes should be regulated by the state uh, or whether data should be public and not privately owned by corporations, uh, who has the access to these new tools and how this is going to be regulated because obviously this, this new developments in biology uh, we can very uh, easily imagine how in, in the near future this will create even bigger divisions in society uh, into groups of people that have a lot of money who have access to editing their, their kids' genome and people who don't, people who, who can uh, create better humans, better more skilled, more, more uh, disease-free, uh, yeah, kids or f or food or or, or everything uh, that uh, themselves uh, and and people who don't. So so this is why this is like an open laboratory because it, we have we have to to ask these questions and we're trying to you know it's uh, uh, America is a country where uh, a lot the, this the intervention of the state into a lot of these developments is very. Uh, um, very low when you think about the, when you compare what's happening in Europe in terms of like the regulation of the of data policies uh, where the, the, there is more and more intervention of, of the states and European law versus America where uh, you know these things are barely like scratching the surface the conversations that are happening at Congress was was what who owns our data and so on so uh, yeah these are questions we're trying to ask and we're hoping that in the future our governments will ask more of these questions as well just as we live uh, through national emergency. <laughs> the current policy market is one of maintenance of status quo, as would be expected. So let's keep things going. For example, if you take security as a topic, the intentional misapplication of a tool to cause harm, and you parse what I'm describing, you might say, well, I could find online the DNA sequence information for a human pathogen or a plant pathogen or an animal pathogen, and I'll print that up from scratch and cause harm with it. Um, 
So how do you govern that? How do you maintain status quo where previously in lineage land you had to have physical access to the infectious agent, maybe risking death to secure it in the first place? Um, so there's big policy opportunities around maintenance of status quo, whether that be economic status quo, safety status quo, security status quo, property rights status quo, whatever you like, status quo. Um, I think what we're representing, though, is a much more compelling opportunity where if you take biology, well, I'll give you the nerd version of it. Civilization runs on jewels, bits, and atoms, energy, information, knowledge, and stuff. How do we provision that stuff at civilization scale, and how is that changing? And the back of the envelope analysis makes it look like, for the first time, we're confronting making a reality where we can provision enough joules, bits, and atoms for 10 billion people without trashing the planet. And that's not been true before, such that the organizations we've been operating within have not been configured to operate in such a flourishing future. And so there's this complementary type of policy opportunity, which is literally quite opportunistic, which is to figure out how to transition from one prior narrative in steady state, which operates on gradients of scarcity all over the place, to a new dynamic steady state that is encoding and expressing and enabling of whatever cultural values you want to instantiate. I have particular views on this, which are probably easy to describe as Jeffersonian in certain ways. But you should argue about that. We should argue about that. Uh, but, but, but then how do you get to that? Um, so, so it's very easy to place students, for example, in policy positions which mostly have to do with maintenance of status quo. I'm just trying to communicate the much bigger opportunities to get to the opportunistic policy po possibilities. And I would say that an, an, an example like from, from real life of what, what uh, is, is something more tangible is uh, when, we, when we think about the enthusiasm around the globe that the uh, companies such as 23andMe have generated, people are uh, 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 willing to, to, to give their... It's terrifying, uh, it's terrifying yes, enthusiasm. Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's, people are willing to d d donate their bio data that, uh, to, to, to learn about their answers ancestry to learn about potential diseases that they may have even though this is just you know there's not that much actually that we can learn from from companies like this but you know fast forward maybe uh, 10, 20, 15 years, uh, what, what is it going to mean for um, co companies uh, that own our bio data that could maybe one day, even though now currently they say that they will not sell it to anyone, but yes, these companies may be bought in the future by another company who no longer signed this contract with us, is no longer um, you know, obliged to, to keep our privacy, and then these companies may share this data with insurance companies, with corporations who would employ people, and then use it against against workers against people you know like who who, who are trying to buy insurance it, it, uh, so this already we can see problems <laughs> <laughs> can I collect a sample uh, no so so I, I, I um, one of the things I struggle with is the, the structure of the narrative and the dream so it would it would be a, a I'd feel really bad given where we are to not reflect a little bit on the, the dreams and narratives, especially with respect to biology, that we inherit and, and wish for a complementary set of dreams and narratives. So um, if you think about popular films involved with the frontiers of biology, what do we got? We've got, um, well, I mentioned Gattaca, which is getting a little bit dated, but people don't think of that as necessarily positive. And then we've got, um, more recently, Contagion, um, where Gwyneth doesn't do so well. That was released uh, to the day on the 10th anniversary of the terror attacks of 01. It was released September 11th, 2011. Thanks. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so the, the, the dreams we're expressing into the future that we might wish to build or could build are um, pandemic and dystopia. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And so be kind of cool to struggle to articulate a complementary dream, especially in the context of the opportunity of ambiguity, which sounds very scary and it does have risks associated with it, but is this big opening 
to get to a very um, compelling, flourishing future. Well, one way of also thinking about this is ever since the emergence of industrialization, or let's say between, since the middle of the 19th century, politics is often framed as a juxtaposition between the people and capital, or the masses and the few capitalists. And, and um, that's a form that might be unsuited for the present, actually. So if we, if we take that serious, that there are collective in, that humans are one form of collective intelligence among many collective intelligences, if you're taking serious that we're living organisms among living organisms, then one would have to come up with questions of justice that are not limited by the human. One would have to come up with a concept of politics that is not such that, you know, ever since Thomas Hobbes and the Leviathan, there is a, a, an opposition between the state of nature and the political state. So politics is always other or more than nature. In the state of nature, everyone, you know, man is wolf's man, and we're all beast-like, and in the state of politics, it's more qualified. So wh what would it mean to come up with forms of justice, with forms of, of um, fighting inequality where microbes or termites or um, ice bears are actually part of it. H how, how would that look like? And is that such an absurd question in a moment of mass species extinction? Actually, not just outside, but in our gut, the many bacteria that disappear that seem to make molecules that are essential for our well-being or health. How can synthetic biology participate in this? Is policy, to repeat Drew's question, a maintenance of the status quo? Actually, is policy a way of guarding the boundary between here nature or the genome as original, as sacred, as the good, and here technology as the late, as the pollutant, as, the, as control? Is that actually adequate to the present? Or if nature is full of technological possibilities of which we are one? then what's at stake in policy would, would need to be rethought dramatically. So do we want to use policy as a, as a limitation of what's possible right now or as a positive conduit where we can shape things together going forward? And how does one do that? Actually, right now, no one knows, which is why I'm thrilled to be director of a program that just tries to articulate these questions and, and tries to find people who are eager to discuss them. Thank you very, very much for, for coming here and joining us. Thank you hugely to Agnieszka and to Drew for joining me on stage. And thank you, as always, to Nicholas and the Berggren Institute for making all of this possible. Thank you, Fries.